Good evening, how's our Coaster Stock family doing tonight? And how was day two's dinner? All right, show of hands. Did you like the meal on the first day? Raise your hand, better than tonight's? Okay, and then let's hear it if you like day two's better. All right, uh, everyone getting in enough rides with the ERTs and everything? And how's everyone's body holding up from all the tours and all the walking? I've seen a couple of people have walked about 12, 13, 14 miles yesterday. I think it's been about the same today. And when you went back behind Orion, how many of you were surprised with how long and how much space that ride took up? Yeah. Yeah, a lot more than it looks when you just look at it on paper. You're looking at renderings and those kind of things, right? But uh, hopefully everybody got some good photos. Unfortunately, it was raining a little bit, but uh, you know, it wouldn't be coaster stock if it didn't rain. We have not had one coaster stock in the six years that we've done it, where there has not been rain or threats of thunderstorms, things like that. So it just you know, fell in line with how it always goes. But we're gonna get things started tonight. Uh, our first guest speaker, a number of you probably had a chance to meet him today when he was signing books over in the Emporium. A very talented young man, Evan Ponstingle. Hello, everybody. I hope you all are having a great evening. I hope you guys had a great time at the book signing. Thank you guys so much for coming. I had a great time seeing everybody, signing everybody's books. Uh, I was so awesome. So thank you guys so much. And if you weren't able to make it today, uh, I'm at Emporium for pretty much the rest of the summer until mid-August. That's when I go to college. <laughs> so, I, I, so if you didn't make it today, be sure to make it. Uh, later on this summer and of course just bring the book in you can buy it there and I'll be happy to sign it for you so uh, this book uh, really was a labor of love so this is my fifth season in merchandise and when I first started one of the questions that I got the most from guests coming in was do you sell any books about the history of Kings Island and not only do we not sell any but nobody had ever even written one so I heard that from so many people that I thought this is something that guests really want. And this is something that this park needs. I, I moved here to Mason in 2007. I was four years old, so I've grown up coming here. And so I was so interested with this park and, and why Kings Island is the way that it is. And I knew there had to be some really cool and really interesting stories. So I decided to write the book, give guests what they wanted, and so that is the genesis of Kings Island, A Ride Through Time. So I started in January of 2019. That was when I first started interviewing people. And that was really one of the key things with this book was interviewing the people that have made it happen. This park has had so many people who, who have put such passion into this park and they've never gotten the credit that they deserve. So altogether, I was able to interview 41 executives from throughout the entire history of this park. So originally, if any of you guys were at the Ace Christmas event in 2019, anybody remember that? I gave a little presentation there. Uh, and at the time, the book was coming out in May of 2020. That did not happen, obviously. <laughs> um, so originally that publisher uh, that I was working under at that time, uh, we, I was aiming for a May 2020 release and a little thing happened called coronavirus. And the publisher used that as an excuse to, to push the book further back, the release of the book, which I was fine with because I was able to add a little bit more, do a little bit more. I was not happy with how it had turned out. Um, there was a lot more that I had wanted to do with that book. And I just was not able to do it because of deadlines. So I worked on it for like an, another month and I was able to do a little bit more um, before I submitted it again. And guess what? It was pushed back again and pushed back again and pushed back again. And finally in September of 2020, uh, they just said, we're not interested in this book anymore. So we're dropping it, we're voiding your contract, which is not good. Um, honestly, probably should have seen that coming. 
uh, my, my, my first ever uh, version of the contract with them, they spelled King's Island with an apostrophe. So I, I think that was a pretty big red flag right there. It should have been a pretty big red flag right there that was not gonna work out. So luckily, I came in contact with a man named Barry Hill uh, right after this had happened. And Barry wrote a great book. It's called Imagineering an American Dreamscape. And for those of you who haven't read it, you've got to get it. It's a phenomenal book, and it's all about the history of the regional theme park in America in general. So Kings Island, Kings Dominion, Six Flags Over Texas, the stories of all of those parks, how they were all started. And Barry did an awesome, awesome job. If you like this book, you would love Imagineering and American Dreamscape because about all the parks that you guys love to visit. I got in contact with him because his book had just come out. I said, How, look, what is your advice for publishing books? He said, well, I, I have the resources to publish books. I've published this myself. I have the resources to publish books. Send me your manuscript and I'll look through it and I'll let you know what I think. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. So I sent, I sent the PDF to him and he looked through it and the snowball was rolling. So he, you know, within a few weeks, he's like, I'd love to get this book. I'd love to be the one to publish it. And Barry really grasped the concept from the beginning. And he really understood not just what this book was at that time, but what it needed to be. You know, what this book needed to be and what I was trying to do with it. So I, I, I was able to be signing a contract with him uh, less than a month after that first publisher dropped me. So it's amazing how that happened and how Barry Hill uh, believed in me that much. And Barry gave me three extra months to work on this book. So that was kind of a, a big thing was, originally I wanted to time it with the opening of Orion. And May 2020 was the, the closest that that publisher, the first publisher could get it. And so in October 2020, the park was closing in less than a month. It's like, you know, do I rush it out and, and not do anything to it? or do I wait until next spring when the park opens? And ultimately, the better option was next spring. So that resulted in me having three extra months to work on it, So, which was amazing, because then I was able to interview a whole bunch of more people. So I interviewed, I think it was about 14 more people, and a lot of these were people that I were wanting to get the first time, and I just couldn't because of deadlines. Uh, and so luckily, I was able to get them in at the end. And so another thing that, another great thing that happened was the cover design. And the cover design is amazing. And I was able to get associated, uh, is, is Rick Bellhumer here? I don't see him. He's our operations director and he connected me with Paul Bonifield who works with Cedar Fair Planning and Design. And I said to Paul, I interviewed him, he's done a lot of great things. Uh, you guys are back with Orion today. So Paul did the on-site scenic design for Orion and Area 72. He did the environmental graphics for Kings Mills Antique Autos and International Street. So he's done a lot of great things here at Kings Island, done a lot of great things up at Cedar Point. Has anybody ridden Snake River Expedition this year? Anybody? Okay, so Paul was the on-site scenic director for that project as well. So Paul did a lot of great things and I said, what do you think about doing the cover design for this book? And he said, I don't know. He said, I have so many projects going on. I will help generate your ideas. I'll, I'll help generate some ideas. And he ended up carrying the cover through to completion. So Paul did an awesome job and that cover would not have been a thing if the first publisher had, had kept me. So, so very, very positive things that came out of this. The book that came out on April 15th is, is, is just on another level above what it would have been had it come out in May of 2020 or even fall of 2020. I was just, Barry Hill allowed me to just do so much more with that book. I, I kind of felt a little bad for him because I, I, I added so much to my manuscript and everything new that I added, I highlighted in red and I gave it to him and he emailed me back and called me. He's like, I, I, I don't know what you added. He's like, can you do something else? I said, well, I highlighted it in red. He said, I'm colorblind. So, <laughs> so I had to, I had to go and like type, like mark on the document, like C attachment A and then do it there. So, but guess what? It turned out amazing. So he was, it is amazing. I'm so appreciative of Barry. He believing so much in this book's success 
because he was able to to take all those edits and add them into the book in like a two week span. And that was a hundred more pages that he was able to add in altogether. A hundred more pages of content. And he was able to do all of that in two weeks. So I cannot you know, thank him enough. So the book came out April 15th and it's been a, a huge success. It's been amazing to see so many people enjoy it and, and take it up and, and really you know, have people come in all the time and tell me how much they enjoy it. I was up at Cedar Point a month ago. I was in the Hotel Breakers gift shop and a kid came up to me. He said, you're the one that wrote the book. I said, how, how did you know? Like, I, I'm, I'm three hours away, like, how do you know? He said, I recognized your voice from Coaster Radio when I did that podcast. I was amazed, I was like, oh my gosh. But I, I have not had a guest recognize me as a guest at Kings Island yet though, so just, just the one at Cedar Point. So I think one of the things that makes Kings Island so special, when you think about this book, you think about what it contains and you think about you know, this park. I think the thing that, that, that differentiates this park, I've, a lot of people ask me this, a lot of like, media people, what, what differentiates this park? And it's the people. You know, it, it's the people, there have been so many people with this park that have just poured their heart and soul into this park and making this park a better place. And, and I think that that is something that you really don't get at a lot of parks, to have that kind of passion. And that's really one of the things that was so amazing interviewing people and interviewing these 41 people that had never had their story shared before. And this book is their outlet to share their stories and cement their legacy, which is so exciting for me. It's so exciting to give them the credit. And I was just so happy to, to the, the, the passion that they had for this park was so overwhelming talking to all of them. It was just amazing, it was inspiring. And the other thing is it's not just the people working here that are so passionate about the park, it's the community. This community, the Cincinnati area, Mason, has, has taken such an ownership of this park. You don't see that in many other amusement parks. You don't see that in really any other park. That connection to the community is unbelievable. It is so strong. You don't, like I said, you don't, you don't really see that at really any other amusement park. And when you have the community that loves this park, when you have the people who work here that love this park so much, that really makes for a one of a kind park. So uh, I guess I'll close. I'll close with a quote from Tim Fisher, who is uh, Cedar Fair COO, if anybody knows, knows Tim. And Tim says, you have the community that loves the park and employees that have loved it just as much. And that chemistry makes for a very special park. That has what made Kings Island so special in the past. And that is what is going to make Kings Island so special in the future. So thank you guys so much for coming. I hope you guys enjoy the book. I hope you guys have a great evening of ERT and the presentation, the rest of the presentation with the folks from Gravity Group. So thank you guys so much for coming and I hope you all enjoy Kings Island Arrive Your Time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Evan. Before we get to our next speakers, uh, just wanna talk a minute about uh, what goes into making coaster stock the event that it is you know i can come up with the itinerary everything that i want to do what i think the event should be but in order to pull it off the way we do you have to get complete buy-in from every single department here at king's island the general manager has to buy in and say yes we need to do this event the marketing director has to buy into it chad showalter has to buy into it the food and beverage department has to buy into it our safety team has to buy into it. They have to feel comfortable that no one's going to stick their finger in the chain on the second lift till the beast for us to be able to do this. You laugh, but that's always a concern whenever you do a behind the scenes tour with this many people on that. Um, everybody has to buy in and want to do this event at the level that I do, or it just doesn't work. So, you know, just think about that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big picture here. It's the whole Kings Island team uh, that makes this event what it is. Now after our next guests come up and speak, we're going to present our award winners uh, for Coaster Stock 2021, so stick around at the end of that. But right now, I'd like to introduce Corey uh, Keeper and Brian Kosmak from The Gravity Group.
Are we on? Oh, you can hear me. Perfect. All right. Uh, so I'm Corey Kiepert, uh, one of the engineers at the Gravity Group, and I've been there since uh, day one of the Gravity Group. Okay, yeah, I'll be louder. All right. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Corey from the Gravity Group. Been there since 2002. Uh, still there, showing up for work every day. And this is Brian. I'm Cosmo. Brian. Uh, this is my boss. So he is going to give me an evaluation after this, or maybe just right in front of you. I don't know. Yeah, I have a quiz, actually, that I was hoping to give you. <laughs> uh, I've been with the company since 2013, so this will be almost eight years. I actually worked in this park, Kings Island, from 2001 to 2013. I see a lot of familiar faces. I started working as a ride operator on the Beast Wooden Roller Coaster, the uh, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, and the Flying Eagles. Uh, I've got a great story about the Flying Eagles, but I, I don't know if we'll have enough time for that. But uh, I'm an engineer at the Gravity Group, and um, I'll let Corey talk a little bit more about what we do. Yeah, so um, essentially, we, uh, we do any legal business in Ohio, technically. That, uh, that's on our, well, anyways, business forms, right? So we're wooden roller coaster designers um, and engineers, and we also build the Timberliner cars and roller coasters around the world. Uh, we just had a ride that we designed open in Sunak, China which was interesting during a global pandemic, trying to uh, uh, basically do an inspection of the ride uh, via like cell phone. So we, we've all had to be very creative during this time. Uh, but one of the greatest things about like work during the uh, coronavirus for me was the opportunity that presented ourselves here at Kings Island on the racer. And uh, I'll let Brian start with you know what went into that because you know, the racer, it's been here for a while. It's, uh, you know, everyone's, it, it, really when I think about a racing wooden roller coaster and just a classic ride, I mean, who doesn't love, uh, you know, the heart and soul that John Allen put into that ride. And so, you know, ha having the opportunity to work on that, you know, as someone that um, loves roller coasters myself, it, it was a great honor, but, uh, Talk, talk more about that, Brian, and, and that day one, <laughs> the intimidation of... The, uh, so my niche at the Gravity Group has been working with a lot of the older existing roller coasters. Uh, I've, and what, what I do, uh, I'm technically kind of like a roller coaster doctor, uh, where I go in and I will talk, look at the coaster from afar, look at a lot of data. I actually get up on a roller coaster and I have this high powered equipment that follows me around uh, and we'll actually measure the track in specific different locations put it in some high-powered engineering program uh, that that someone much smarter than me created and then it'll spit out a bunch of analysis and say hey this is what's going on with your coaster then I go to the park and say hey well this is what you got to do to to help to help it out uh, I've worked on probably, I've worked on, the oldest coaster I've worked on is Thunderhawk at Dorney Park, uh, and, and uh, I've worked on, Re not Rebel Yell, what's it called now, Racer 75, 75, uh, The Voyage, uh, which is running really well, and um, so there's a lot of parks that, that, you know, hire my services or our services, and, and so Kings Island uh, actually threw somebody that he knows. Did you want to follow that up? Oh, go ahead, keep going. So his former boss at CCI, he used to work for an old coaster company, CCI, Custom Coasters, actually worked here at Kings Island, called him up. He's like, Brian, why don't you come to Kings Island with me? Now, I come as a guest a lot, but never to work behind the scenes. And within, a couple days, I'm on the racer with my high-powered equipment, looking at a 50-year-old roller coaster, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, one of the the best stories I have is actually one of the, the the biggest, most exciting things about working here is actually seeing people that I worked with a long time ago. My my the one of the stories that I have is 
the director of merchandise team, his name is Steve Ryan. He's been around this park for, he's an icon. And he, I don't know why he was over there by the racer, but I'm there holding my high powered equipment. And he looks at me and he's like, Kaz? I'm like, yeah. Hey Steve, how you doing? And uh, he's like, oh God, I'm never riding this ride ever again. Now that you're on it. And I don't know if he has or not. So, but, uh, but there was a lot going on with the racer. Uh, one of the challenges is when we build a new roller coaster, it, you, you start from scratch. And the racer is definitely, it's not a start from scratch. There has been several things that have happened through the years to keep it running, uh, keep it in prime condition. But after a while with a, good, with a wooden roller coaster, they, they, they get a little tired. It's kind of like me. I mean, I'm almost as old as the racer, but I'm not quite there. And so, you know, I know that I have some aches and pains that I, I never used to have. So when it comes time for us to, to work on a ride, especially something that, you know, it's close to my age. I mean, there are so many people that have looked at the ride and, and made adjustments and, and their own ideas of how they can, can fix it, which is fine. But we, we had the opportunity to uh, basically start over. I mean, we, we preserved like a lot of the structure, you know, when, when you wrote it, um, you know, that's a lot of the original structure still, but we removed the track. And, you know, while Brian was doing his doctoring and figuring, I was putting tools together and assembling a crew. And I, I had the joy of coming here in December um, you know, with saws and other equipment and, and oversee people basically removing the track. And for me, <laughs> just seeing the racer um, with the guts removed, essentially. I don't know if any of you saw it. He looked the... naked. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it didn't look like, it looked naked. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, on the one hand, it was like refreshing, like, wow, that was fast. That, that was really, that went faster than I thought it would to, to take the guts out. But uh, on the other hand, it's like, wow, there's a lot of space in here. Um, and, and then, um, you know, we had new track, new profile to, to put on the ride. And I think the, the, the challenging thing for us is when we do a ride now with our Timberliner cars, they're, they're class five, which from like a, a design lingo standpoint means we can put a lot more air time in that ride than uh, the racer with its classic classic trains and so we had to find a balance of you know making that ride as good as possible but still you know staying within those limits and you, you want to talk a little bit about that the guy behind me is actually it sounds like he really enjoyed diamondback did you enjoy that ride it's no racer. <laughs> By the way, I was one of the best spiel people. I see Megan in the background. Was I not one of the best spiel people? I, I could I could still do a B spiel. Take up 100 and, oh, I can't, not not right now. But uh, may, maybe later, maybe. I take up 110 feet, drop you 135 feet, and then go 45 degrees. Then it's gonna do it again, taking you down a drop of 141 feet at a near vertical angle of 18 degrees. <laughs> Three or four and a half minute journey through the woods, you'll experience not one, not two, but four tunnels. I mean, flipped upside down, not six, not seven, but zero times. <laughs> See, that Enjoy was, your ride on the legendary beast. That was not a skill that he told us about when we hired him. No, you didn't. I don't know how I got hired there, to be honest with you. They, they're just like, all right, well, this guy. Actually, when I started at the Gravity Group, they had me doing UPS labels. So um, I, I've come a different, along. I don't know if it's better or worse. But uh, talking about the race here. Okay, so one of the things, we were talking about the profile of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about the profile. Oh, okay, and how, you know, so, we, we couldn't give it that negative, like, one and a half G hill that we wanted. So one of the things when I look at, like I said, I have a niche for these these classic coasters and going in and, and basically trying to find a different way than, than putting a whole new steel track on or, or just trying to keep it, the flavor of the ride in its original thing. Now, John Allen, when he designed the ride, he did not have the same technology that 
myself and Corey have. Uh, he had 1950s technology. And one of the hardest things about this ride is finding, just trying to find the existing design documents for it. John Allen probably gave, had one plan view, a plan view for those of you who do not know, is the, if you're looking down on the roller coaster itself, you can see where all the bents are. And a bent is like one individual support. It's the cross section. It's the cross section. So he probably supplied them with one plan view and then one profile view. A profile view is the, the actual up and down. The, the elevation view, the side view. The elevation view, yes. So, and then he used a lot of, I mean, there, there's so many different uh, techniques that go into designing a roller coaster. And if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of it, it's a lot of calculus, uh, it's a lot of geometry, it's a, it's a lot of just high powered math. And if you want to make one change to it, if you're just doing it all by hand, which you could do, it might take you forever. So John used some rules of thumb that, that worked for him and he just kept doing it, doing it, doing it. Now for me, I, I kind of studied what John did and what the roller coasters of roller coaster designers of the past did. The Thunderhawk designer, which was Trey. I should. Been, you you anyone, should know this. I should know who who worked at uh, PTC. But anyways, it's not John. It's not John Miller. It's the other guy. Track, track, yeah, schmack, schmack. It's a schmack coaster. Thank you. Yeah, they, they all kind of use the same, I, I should know that, but uh, same different techniques. And, and, and after a while, Curtis Summers used different techniques. They used different techniques at CCI. So I got to be really interested to see how that works. And one of the unique things about John Allen is when you're going down, down his hill, he would keep the same radius of curvature going all the way over. And then you would hit like a straight section and then you would hit the valley. So when you were going over, or at least some of the older hills there, you're kind of trying, you're, you're, you're at like 0 0.6, 0 0.5 G going over the hill, and then suddenly you hit the two and a half, three G hitting down on the hill. That might not make much sense to anybody, but in other words, it's just you like, you know, throwing down real hard on that. So what we were able to do is break it out basically foot by foot and change that radius of curvature to make it a little bit, a lot smoother. So when you're going over the crest of that hill and coming down into the valley, you start to really feel yourself lift and then gently put yourself down. Uh, we do that on a lot of stuff, a lot of the side to side stuff too. Um, like when you're riding some of the older coasters, you'll be you know, kind of riding on the side like this and then suddenly you're jerked to the right hand side. You don't see that on, on some of the newer, you know, like Orion or, or Mystic or, or anything like that. So. Uh, and, and then we were able to try and, you know, reprofile. We actually reshaped the curve of the the actual hill itself. I think we raised that about a foot, which isn't much. Uh, but in other sections, if you look at some of the construction photos, we dropped it by about four feet in some spots, just so you can feel a nice gentle land as you go down. So really, right now, the the stats on RCDB or something for the profile for the length, it's probably wrong. Right? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, but essentially, like Brian, he, uh, he was actually doing a lot of the work in the office, prepping and, um, you know, getting things ready to reconstruct the ride. And, you know, he did that after he was out here forever, you know, with, with his uh, equipment measuring the ride. And I mean, we, there were different people, there was, um, you know, from our team, like Chad, uh, Jonathan, just different people would come out with him on different uh, measuring trips. Sometimes I would come. But I spent a lot of time out here in December, won the park. I mean, it's amazing today to see a lot of people in here because when I was here in December, there, there were just, uh, there was like the maintenance crew, maybe some groundskeepers, security, and then uh, a handful of our workers. <laughs> Uh, the so, first time I saw Don was like March, in the middle of March, and I, I told him like I think I've been here a heck of a lot more times than you have. Yeah, I mean like, we yeah, had a ten, had... yeah, I mean we had a ten question test that we had to take to get into the park every day. Um, you know, uh, yes, no, maybe so, um, 
you know, temperature scan, masks, shields, everything. And, you know, it's just a, a very different time to be working um, at a park on a ride. And we had our office uh, right there in the uh, entrance area for Orion. So Is every- Is it yeah, yeah. I mean, my my kids are like. I apologize for our construction manager, Smokes Rick. If you see Steve Ryan at all, if it smells like smoke in there, it was not my fault. All right. <laughs> Nor mine. You pointed at no, me. Not you. You, you could have told Jeff the not. Oh, you know. But anyways, anyways. So uh, like every uh, from early December until sometime in March, uh, you know, we were on site just about every day installing track after we uh, after we tore it out and you know one of the great things about the ride being the racer was I mean it's it's pretty old and you know like I don't I thought I you were gonna say it was there was two of them well yeah I mean there's so two. you get done with one side and then you're like uh oh I gotta do the other side it's now. twice the fun it's twice yeah. the fun yeah really that's is. what I thought you were gonna say but but I think one of the bigger challenges like we're used to going in and uh, you know Brian will do his doctor thing on the rides, and it's one thing you know this this track needs to go up or down or, or left or right. But when you have something like the racer that's been there you know 40 some years, close to 50, and uh, there are two of them side by side, but but let's say that structure isn't perfectly plumb anymore. Like some of the adjustments that you have to make on one side versus the other, and we're trying to use. Um, you know the same piece of wood to support both tracks like a we call them ledgers underneath the track like a, a 4x12 ledger material and typically you know you might get 12 foot material but we had to get longer stuff because of the the racer luckily they grew bigger trees and uh, well he's right there's always something when you take the lid off the car which is the, the racer you it's so interesting how you, even though you could put as big of a plan together as possible with these older coasters, you don't know what you're going to see. Uh, one of the biggest things that I, that still, I, I don't, I, I can't even understand why, but one, one side of the racer's outbound section was an inch and a half higher than the other, the other side. It had, we have, there's, there's stacks of track in a wood coaster. Typically they are uh, eight or seven or eight, seven or eight stacks and the one side of the racer i think it was this side which is what red red side had seven layers but the other side had eight layers of track so somewhere in the process of putting the track together they decided let's add another layer of track apparently that's how it started a long time ago like that's how it was built originally but I, I, I don't know. I, I think John Allen that. looked in a crystal ball and was like, how can I bug Brian someday? <laughs> I'm sure he did. How can I make another roller coaster designer sweat in the middle of winter in COVID? There you go. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, the, the Racer Project, it was a great, it was a great opportunity for us, um, especially being neighbors. I mean, all the talk about the Kings Island book um, and just the community aspect of, uh, of Kings Island being a local wooden roller coaster company and having the opportunity to work on uh, something as great as the racer, I mean, it was it was truly an honor. And uh, it was nice during the pandemic to just be like, yeah, I'm going to the job site. And my wife didn't think it was across the across the ocean. It was, it was a King's Island. I could still be home and make dinner. So she was happy. I, I got nothing else about the racer. Um, do you want to? Who's been on it this year? Like, what's your favorite seat? I like the front on the blue side. If you haven't been on the front on the blue side, it's it's happening there. It's really happening there. How about you, Corey? You've been on it once. I did. I rode the front on the blue side. There you go. Just I had to listen to my boss there. <laughs> do you want to open it up to questions then? Yeah, yeah, that would be fine. We, we love you too. Keep it up. We paid him to do that. All right, so are there any questions about the Gravity Group, about the racer, about anything? Go ahead. Uh, that's, that's not up to us. Uh, I, I, you could probably spend more money in the park 
spending more money in the park will help the park out and hopefully they'll shovel a little bit of our way so but uh, that's not it's not up to us uh, we don't know what the future holds uh, we're actually going to be busy in france next year uh, working on an existing coaster called the Tenere de Zeus. Tenere de Zeus at Park Asterix. So, yes. Uh, if you haven't been on it, there, there's, we have, we've been working, it's been a three-year project. Uh, Corey and I got to go to Paris last year in the middle of a pandemic. If you thought we're fun up here now, can you imagine us on a masked full flight to Paris? But uh, uh, our schedule's picking up. The economy's looking good, and um, uh, I'm busy. I know you're busy. Yeah, I'm so, busy. That's a good question. We'd love to finish it up. Lumber prices are going down now, so that's good. Any other questions? Gentlemen, way in the back with the, the orange shirt. We would love to build a ground up coaster anywhere. We'll do it in your backyard even if you have the money and the zoning. So. My kids want me to do one, actually. My 10-year-old would love would love for me to build one here. That's for sure. So, Go ahead, yes. What's the most challenging project you guys have undertaken, and what made it challenging? Ooh, it's probably different for both of us. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> Brian needs time to think. No, for me, uh, every project that we work on, um, it, it has its unique challenges, right? And so... I think it's difficult to say this one was easier than that one. Um, you know, the only time a project is maybe simple is when someone says, I'd like to rebuild that ride as is. You know, those, those are the easy ones. Uh, you know, for me, one of the most challenging rides that, that I was able to be a part of was Twister at Grunelund. Um, we literally had to shoehorn that ride into the park. We went over, under, and through other rides and roller coasters, and so, for me, you know, thank goodness that I wasn't John Allen and that we had the technology we have today with 3D scans and uh, like just amazing like CAD images of the park. So otherwise that ride would not be possible. The most challenging project I ever did is anything with Corey. <laughs> I was thinking you were going to say Working that. Working with Corey. <laughs> no, he's great. He's a great, he's a great boss. Uh, for me, I, you know, I don't really have one right now. Um, which one is I've, have I been really frustrated with? Has there Every been day is simple for Brian. <laughs> we don't work him hard enough. Is really I, I have a model right that here. you got to smile, be consistent, and do your best. If you do those three things, you can you and stomp on the floor with one foot. That's I tell Corey that all the time. Uh, I mean, every it's it's. I mean, working in an amusement park and then. Uh, you know, I didn't do any engineering here at all. I have a master's degree in engineering, uh, so does Corey, but I didn't do any engineering here. And then going to the gravity group, I think a lot of what I learned here at this park it, it has helped me with with the gravity group. I don't know how much longer we have, 10, 10 minutes? He was, I saw Don and I'm like, uh-oh, he's, he's getting ready. I saw him with the hook. He was gonna pull he's gonna us hook off me up. He's like, all right, but, time. can we take one more question? Oh yeah, you got time. Let me finish okay. my thought here, but um, uh, you, you know, there's there's working in the amusement park industry. It's it's a, it's a life changing experience, uh, and um, I've done a lot here. I, I mean, I, I hired a lot of 16 year old kids. I operated the beast. Um, I've actually on that Eiffel Tower, they they made me go from one elevator to the other elevator. In a, in a training seminar, which terrified me. I actually had to go up to the top of Drop Tower one time uh, with in an elevator. There's an elevator during the center of it and during some kind of training. And I, I froze when I got up there. It's like an all graded thing up there. I froze, the, the delirium looked like it was just a, a little model. They actually had to save me. They turned that into a, a rescue for me. But long story short, um, the, just working here has helped me prepare for, for working with different parks. You kind of know the, the lay of the land. Uh, and, and a lot of parks are, even though they're different, a lot of them are the same. They are all are very, very passionate about what they do. Um, and uh, that's not answering the question of the hardest project I've, I've worked on. We'll say the racer. A <laughs> racer. Yeah, construction manager is something else. So <laughs> that's not Corey, by the way. Take one more. 
The guy there, the, the Big Bad Wolf, is it the band? No, that's not Big Bad Wolf. The band. The band. That's not a roller coaster, is it? Uh, the band. The band. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. Do you think we'll ever see the backwards uh, racer again? That's not, that's not into our... We design roller coasters, and so those that's not in our wheelhouse, you know? Like, we're... <laughs> Yeah. We do whatever we're told, you know, essentially. We never, you She's know, got another a thing. coming up, you never know, but. Well, th th this leads into my thing. Like, people are always like, do you get to name them? And it's like, no, we've never had the uh, opportunity to name one of our rides. And it's kind of like, we help give birth to the rides, but we don't have naming rights, right? Yeah, but anyways, someday, we can hope. We got one more, can we get one more? Yeah, keep going. Keep going, he's gonna kind of stop. Yes, go ahead. What is the difference between the uh, Timberliner car and the Philadelphia car? Uh, the stance of Tenere are two suits. It goes up really, really high. Goes down really, really low through a tunnel. It does a couple stuff. It does some stuff, some air time. And then I think there's another tunnel. What, what's, odd, what's, what's really weird is I don't remember any stats at all. I can name the B stats. I, I grew up in Cleveland. I can name every Cedar Point. Magnum takes you up 205 feet, whatever stat. But when it comes to one of our rides, I have no idea. I have no idea. But so, I mean, look, but uh, Tanir, to do he Zeus. does because he's the one trying to sell the thing. So maybe you know the stats because I don't. Well, Tanir do Zeus, which is two, I guess. Tanir two Zeus, like that actually will have a backwards car, so uh, you'll be able to ride that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. You, so I mean, anyone that you know wants to ride a wooden roller coaster backwards can go to France <laughs> or Australia. So. Anything else? Go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. Have we ridden the Voyage Trimless? I have not. I thought, you know, like way back when, I think I have. I have never been on it at night either. <laughs> trust, trust me, they, they keep inviting me to go to the Hollywood, what, what, the Hollywood nights, and I, I can't, I, I, not yet at least. So, sorry. Maybe for like the 10th or the 12th or 20th anniversary, you know. It's getting old, 2006? Yeah, it's older, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Gentlemen over there. Oh. I'm sorry? Well, this is pretty interesting because it didn't happen until probably August of last year. So it was a quick turnaround. Uh, I, so we were, you know, by August, I'm being drugged here the first day that they're not operating. And then um, within a couple weeks, I'm surveying different portions of the ride, looking at it. And um, yeah, but, but being convenient neighbors, you know, just 15 minutes down the road, shipping and everything can happen much more quickly. So, you know, for us to mobilize and come here, it's more like going over to a friend's house, you know? So, yeah. And my frequent flyer miles have gone rock bottom. Yeah, so. it wasn't so good for that. Yeah, so. no first class for Brian. <laughs> Are we done? Like yeah. you, uh, you can you can take a couple more. A couple right. more. A couple more. Go ahead. Well, I mean that uh, I think technically, yes, the the longest single track ride. Um, you know, we did a racing roller coaster in Wuhan that uh, I believe is a little bit longer if you put the two of those tracks together, so. But yeah, the Voyage certainly, and as far as single lift, yeah. I mean, it's number two right now in the world, so yeah. Of the longest, is it? It is, you didn't know that? Of, uh, just of wood coasters, right? Of wood roller coasters, oh, yeah, yeah, The yeah, one yeah. over here is longer, right? But yeah, a little bit, I think. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't want to change my spiel, you know? All right, any others? In the back. Favorite creation, your favorite Gravity Group coaster. Your favorite Gravity Group coaster. For Brian, it's whichever one he gets off of, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were at, what? I mean, you ride Switchback, and you're like, this is the best. Switchback is the best. <laughs> it's just different. Yeah. I mean, every, every ride is unique. It's kind of like... I mean, we work on these things for many, many months, so that in many ways they're kind of like our kids. So um, you don't go around saying, oh, I like that one better than that one. They're all unique, and we, we have a warm place in our heart for, for all of them. I like the Kentucky Flyer, though. 
Yeah, that's a good ride too. That's a good one. Spunky. It's it's one of our youngest roller coasters. <laughs> so terrible twos, threes. I don't know. Go on. Any any other questions? Going once. Yes. Yeah, I mean now uh, this year is actually one of the worst years to be in our industry. Really, I mean just frankly because right you have the parks if, if you think about it like across the world there were probably only about half of the amusement parks that opened over the last year right and then during that the price of everything has gone up like you've seen it at the grocery stores the price of meat everything so the price of lumber it went up like 400 percent price of steels up so I mean you have parks that you know, they didn't have money from people attending. And then you say, oh, the material cost is, by the way, has gone way, way up. And so that doesn't really make for a, a good time to, uh, to be a roller coaster engineer. So we have our hat out back that you can just throw a nickel in on the way out. But no, like we, we've been staying busy and uh, the, we, we've actually, we've been able to hire a few people during the pandemic for just different projects and things that we had. So, you know, we're we're doing our best to, you know, be smart in this time and also, um, you know, be realistic with people. Uh, we understand that with, if someone says that the price of lumber is up 400%, you know, there are a lot of people that might say, this isn't the time to build that new ride. But, uh, you know, it's also, I think there's a lot of pent up demand where people are coming to the parks and there are a lot of parks that are saying, you know what, we, we want to do some work on this ride or that ride. And so, you know, we're, we're doing our part to uh, work side by side with parks and uh, do whatever, you know, as, as far as, you know, like something like the racer to try to give it new life, which, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic when I wrote it the other day. I was excited. I mean, I, I saw the numbers on the accelerometer graph because we look at that numbers and we're like, oh yeah, that's a good ride. But I mean, it, it is, riding it is probably better, right? So, anything else? Let's go ride, I think they want to ride roller coasters. I think they do too. Yeah, right. But I see some awards here, right? Right, are we? Are we yeah, we do have some awards for some of our contestants. I have one final question for Brian. How's that uh, Diamondback model working these days? <laughs> Birdie, how's the Diamondback model working? There are, okay, so a short story, which might be a long story, but back when I worked here, uh, one of my bosses now, he's a part owner of Coaster Dynamics, or CDX Blocks, which is, they do uh, realistic, they do like a Lego type of thing now, which is awesome, by the way, uh, but, we were sitting at dinner one time, and he told me, he's like, I know what you guys are getting next year. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't even know what we're getting next year. He's like, we'll build a model for you. So I talked to this guy, and, and he's like, yeah, we'll get a model. So before you knew it, on uh, the day that we announced Diamondback, uh, you know, they took down these curtains, and there's a big Diamondback model that's, that's working. And uh, it spent some time in the front window of International Restaurant. And uh, it was running three trains. It was awesome. And then it got, it, and after a while, it just, it, it, I mean, Diamondback wasn't new. And, and I asked my, my beautiful wife here, I'm like, if they let me take this thing home, would, would you let me have it? And she's thinking to herself, there's no way in God's good graces that they're ever, Kings Island's ever going to let them have this model. The next day, I'm bringing it home. <laughs> It's, it, it needs a little TLC, but uh, we can get her back up and running. But uh, I have two boys, an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old, and they, they our basement is just, there's probably 15 different roller coasters down there, made out of Legos, the old school Legos, coaster dynamic blocks, cardboard. What else do you, what else do you got out of there? Poster board. They once dared me to make a model roller coaster out of poster board, and I did. It worked for a day, so. <laughs> Brian, Anyways, it's running well, Don. That's short. Yeah, that's long good. story short. Yeah, Brian and I had to take that model one time. We had to drive it up to Sandusky. We were having these uh, corporate meetings, and we wanted to show off our new rides. I we forgot took about that. Yeah, that was a fun trip. Oh.
with that. And then our group sales team wanted us to take it around whenever they were going to pitch new clients and things to show here's our new product. And it wasn't built for travel. No, she, she's, it's huge. It's, uh, I think, 16 feet long, wow. 8 feet wide. It's, it's a bit, there's some videos online, not of my basement, but um, it, it's, it's pretty unique. If you're a modeler out here, I can show you pictures of it on my phone. I got them somewhere in there. But, uh, but yeah, we did go up to Sandusky with that thing. Yeah. That was All right, well, let's hear it for Brian and Corey. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, before uh, you heard from the Gravity Group, I mentioned about needing like the buy-in from the different divisions and things like that. Well, I want to point up a couple people up top. Rick, come on back here a minute. So we have Rick and Megan, so turn around. And uh, thank Rick and Megan. They are our operations team. So whenever you come up and say the ride crews are phenomenal and telling us how you know great they are, right up there it starts with those two and their leadership. All right, we had some contests. Uh, for coaster stock, so now it's time to present those awards. Kyle, can you come on up? Because I need you to take a photo. Now, when, when you come up, stay up here. We're going to take an individual photo, then we're going to take a group photo. And uh, there were some uh, pretty competitive this year in most categories. We're going to start with the scavenger hunt. Our scavenger hunt winner, Liz Roth. Come on up on the stage, Liz. So Liz, how many coaster stocks now for you? Liz has been to all six of our coaster stocks. She finally won this, she competes hard every single year for the scavenger hunt, so she finally wins it. Our photo contest winner, again, what we were trying to do this year, a little different, but trying to capture the spirit of what coaster stock is. And our contest winner for the photo is, Brett Bertolino. We have Brett here. Probably riding a ride right now, so we don't have Brett yet. Our video contest winner, Alexis Williamson. Come on up. This year we introduced the new game for Coaster Stock, Kings Island Opoly. Uh, we started with 16 contestants, narrowed it down to four. They competed today, and our tournament champion is Cat Jackson. <laughs> and our social media rock star. This award goes to the person, the group that we felt did the best job of covering coaster stock. If, if you were a reporter telling the story of the event, and several of you did it better than I can, and I was one of the creators of this event, so uh, really a lot of great content out there. And our coaster stock 2021 social media rock star is Andrew Stillwell, Coaster 101. Come on up. You also get a poster by Chris, where's Chris Warner? He designed this poster, it's uh, Orion, so be nice hanging on your wall. So again, hand for our, our award winners for this year's poster stock. I'll go ahead and grab a photo of them. And that's gonna conclude our guest speakers for tonight. We still have three and a half hours of coaster stock left. Hopefully you all have enough left in the tank to finish up the night strong. So enjoy your ERT tonight. I'll see you out in the park. Thanks for coming.